One of the many gifts I was given at the Edinburgh Meet, many generous gifts, was this high voltage module. And um, I'd like to warn you in advance that this video contains alcohol, technical stupidity and profanities and electric shock. And that's about to come up right now. So we've just finished work, and because we're about to do something incredibly stupid, we decided to get the uh, BigClive.com uh, logo here and have a good drink as well. So let's move the drinks out of the way as a health and safety precaution, because we don't want to spill the drinks, do we? And the whole idea of this video is to test whether these modules sold on eBay are stun gun modules. So the only way to find that out is to put my hand across it, so let's go. <laughs> oh! Fucking hell! <laughs> Yeah, stun gun modules, that fucking hell. Ah, yes, well, I did warn you that we're going to be profanities, and there were profanities, and completely unavoidable profanities at that, so definitely a Peggy 18 video. So, uh, this module, I initially thought maybe it's being sold for lighting gas or, you know, driving neon tubes, but I get the feeling that it is a stun gun module. And it'd be nice to completely strip this apart and show you the structure inside, but it is solidly potted in hard black resin, which is always a bit destructive to get into. But I know the type of circuitry that's in these, because uh, while I was in America some time ago, I bought a stun gun and I... Well, first of all, I stuck it in my thigh and pulled the trigger, which turned out to be a bad idea, but, you know, it had to be done. And it caused immense black and blue sort of pain sensations inside without leaving a mark, which is very impressive. Um, these are, however, stun guns are, however, completely illegal in the UK. They're classified as a handgun because the legal industry does not like anything that people might use to protect themselves from criminals because that's not profitable. So I analysed the circuitry in the stun gun that I'd bought the circuit board from it. And it looked like this. You started off with the, vol the low voltage supply, which in this case, it, this will actually operate from 1.5 volts to about 3 volts. And you get 9 volt versions as well. And the way it steps the voltage up to such a staggeringly high output voltage. Now, typically speaking, I've always tended to work in 1 millimeter per kilovolt. It's not that accurate. Um, I would say this is going to be in the region probably of about 20 to... 30 or 40 kilovolts this can put out at max. Certainly not what they quote, some of the uh, sellers quote these as putting out the sort of 100 kilovolt, 200 kilovolt. It's they're just bumping up the value for drama. But the it starts off with a very low voltage, 3 volts in this case, and it will have a very simple step up circuit which involves the first transformer, a transformer that might look like this one on this switch mode power supply. And it will operate at high frequency, and it will be switched by probably a single transistor. He said, drawing a transistor quite badly, but that's okay. And there'll be a feedback winding, which may be from the positive rail or negative rail, with a resistor, uh, probably from the positive rail, so it self-starts. With a resistor, maybe a capacitor too. Let's draw a little capacitor down here, just because it usually has something like that. I'm not sure what's in that one because uh, this one is, of course, potted in resin. And the net result is that this transformer will oscillate at high frequency from the low voltage and it will step the voltage up to a very high voltage winding, say, in the region of 1,000 volts, which is manageable. You can, with proper insulation, you can step the voltage up to 1,000 volts in a small transformer like this without it necessarily arcing over too easily. But that output could not be... If, we, if I applied that across my skin, it would burn, it would arc, but it wouldn't give me a shock. It wouldn't give any sensation because the frequency is above that which the nerves can respond to. So what they do is they then rectify that with a stack of diodes in series, usually typical one-amp diodes, but the high frequency, the, the sort of high... Um, sort of, what do, they, what do they call that? The Well, high frequency diodes is the best way to describe it. The fast recovery time diodes, which are needed for the high frequency operation of this transformer. And that then charges a high voltage capacitor in series with a very heavy primary winding on a transformer. And across that is then a trigger circuit, and in some cases it's as simple as a spark gap. Now, in the stun gun I bought and took to bits, the spark gap inside consisted of two metal strips in the circuit board shaped like this, just one metal strip across the other, 
And you could tweak the spark gap by putting a fine blade in between them and just separating them slightly. And the idea of the spark gap is that once the voltage across this capacitor has risen to a high enough voltage, it will arc across this. It will ionise the air, it will spark across, and as soon as it does so, it causes localised ionisation in the air, and that means that the voltage drop across the, the, that set of contacts will drop, so you end up with quite a significant amount of the charge in this capacitor being suddenly dumped, and it goes through this coil. Now, when it's charging that capacitor, the current is also flowing through the coil, but the, this coil down here is not optimised for high-frequency use, so it just ignores the fact that there's a high-frequency DC spikes charging this capacitor through it. However, when this spark gap fires, and it does dump this, uh, the current from the capacitor, the charge, through this uh, coil, what actually happens is that this coil is often based on a traditional transformer-type arrangement of just a slab of steel plates. And certainly the stun gun I bought contained, uh, it had a transformer inside that from the end on looked like that. There was a square section with laminated plates and it, it was all potted in resin and you could see the, sort of the coils of the tape and the windings. So this uh, core has the few turns of the primary that's uh, driven by this capacitor discharge circuit and then over the top of that, it's got uh, a layer of tape, or layer more than one layer of tape perhaps, and then lots and lots of fine windings going from one end to the other, and then a layer of more tape for insulation, then more windings going back the way, more layers of tape, more windings go back. You end up with this big round transformer with this square section, then this spiral of tape with all these layers of windings. And because this transformer has been given one sharp pulse, it generates... Uh, stepped up high voltage low current pulse and that's what uh, stimulates the nerves that's what gives a spark across the output and uh, stimulates the nerves because it is just a, a single DC pulse as opposed to the sort of high frequency coming from this uh, first stage and the electrodes in a stun gun typically the stylish stun gun looks like that it's uh, got this sort of body like that the trigger and then it's got the probes come out the front and then it's got two probes uh, close to the middle that spark between them. And these are usually just physically connected together as loops of metal. And the reason the, uh, they're close together in the middle and far apart at the front is because if you operate these transformers open circuit, the voltage can be so high. Say, for instance, I operated this, but I just left it running with the wires spaced apart like that. The voltage across the windings inside will get so high that it could actually flash over and it could damage them. But by uh, keeping a spark gap in the middle, it means that uh, not only do you get an intimidating spark and the cracking noise, but it caps the maximum voltage that can be generated across this transformer before that the air ionises in this gap and it sparks. So that gives the visual effect. But when you actually press that against someone, what actually happens is that uh, it finds an easier route through their body. And that's even breaking through the layers of the clothing that get in between because the the combined dielectric strength is lower than the uh, sort of the fifteen to half inch, fifteen millimeter spark gap here. And when the current passes through the body, it does so as that sharp spike, and it creates a sort of voltage gradient that affects lots of nerves. Now, because it's not a continuous AC current, it doesn't cause muscle contraction, but it does cause stimulation of the nerves in a large area. It causes a sort of large field within the body that causes major nerve stimulation and that causes pain. It also causes, in the case of applying it to the base of someone's spine, which is not recommended, it can cause loss of nerve control. It can swamp out the nerves of the electrical signal and it can make people fall down, which is really ultimately what stun guns are used for and tasers and things like that. So um, the circuitry, when it comes to the crunch, it's very simple. It's just the, those two stages. The first stage that goes up to about 1,000 volts and then the pulsed output that then steps 1,000 volts up to, well, 40 or more times that to get the, sort of the 40,000 volts sort of level. So um, the very interesting, the transformer, it's not something that you could easily wind yourself. Uh, these are often vacuum potted in resin where the resin's poured in, then a vacuum's pulled and it draws all the air bubbles out from the resin because that's quite important because these transformers will just break down at low voltage if they're not potted properly. 
But then these units are cheap, and I, I guess that just alludes to the fact they're mass-produced. So, um, yes, stun guns. They're very interesting. The circuitry isn't that complex. The construction is complex, and these little modules being sold on eBay are almost certainly intended for use as stun guns.